The book of 1 John is never quoted or admired like Paul's epistles, such as Romans and Ephesians. While the Gospel of John is probably the most popular book of the Bible, John's first epistle is one of the least popular among the New Testament books. I think that's kind of a shame because there's a lot of spiritual meat in this little epistle. There are a couple of major themes that are clearly expressed in John's first epistle. The first theme, which all Christians appreciate and magnify, is the love of God. And the second theme, which is a little bit more controversial, has to do with evidence for salvation in the life of believers. Let's begin by looking at the theme of the love of God. In the third chapter, John writes, Behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed on us, that we should be called children of God. One of the most common expressions that has to do with people who've been redeemed by Christ is the idea of us being children of God. Yes, we are disciples of Jesus. You could also call us members of the army of God, and we are servants of God. But the one thing God seems to emphasize more than anything else is that through Jesus Christ, we become God's children. We are to pray our Father, which art in heaven. And as God's children, our Heavenly Father loves us immensely. Later in the book, John writes, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is of God. John gives us an exhortation, and then he gives us the reason for that exhortation. What are we to do? Love one another. And why must we do this? Well, he says love is from God. To be born of this God of love and not to love our brothers and sisters who are also born of God is impossible. God exudes love, and it is expected that those who receive his nature through the new birth and through faith in Jesus will also manifest that love. In the same chapter, John says twice, God is love. John has been called the Apostle of Love, and both in this epistle and in the Gospel of John, we read much about the love of God. But there is a second theme that saturates the words of this little epistle that some people are just not so enthusiastic about. Throughout the book, John tells us again and again that there must be evidence in our lives that we truly belong to Jesus and he gets very specific about the nature of this evidence. When we receive Jesus, there will be some changes. In fact, John tells us there must be changes or else any claims that we have about our faith are false. These changes, or you could say evidences, are indicators that the miracle has happened. We have passed from darkness to light. In the first chapter, John writes, if we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. This may seem a little vague, the idea of walking in darkness. What is it exactly to walk in darkness? Well, John's going to get more specific throughout the book, but here we find a major premise of John, and that is it is possible to say you have fellowship with Christ, and yet you're lying. In other words, you don't have fellowship with Jesus, but you think you do, and you tell people that you do. Anyone who says that he fellowships with Jesus must, in some way, be a believer of some kind or another. But according to John, he's not a genuine believer if he's not walking in the light. He thinks he's a Christian, he says he's a Christian, but in truth he is a liar because he's not at all a Christian. He is deceiving himself. In the second chapter, John writes, Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. Once again, John is calling a certain class of professing Christians liars. And who would that be? People who say they know Jesus, but they don't keep his commandments. Now, some may protest, wait a minute. 
Salvation comes by believing in Jesus, not by keeping any commandments. And I'm sure John would agree with you. After all, it was in his gospel account that he quoted Jesus saying, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Whoever believes in him. But here in the first John epistle, he plainly tells us that those who profess to know Jesus but refuse to keep his commandments are lying. They're lying to themselves and to everybody else. John is not saying that keeping God's commandments saves us, but he is surely insisting that if our faith is genuine and comes directly from God, the end result will be that we're given a heart that eagerly desires to follow the commandments and precepts of our Heavenly Father. Now, if this were not in the Bible, and I preach that concept, Christians would be ready to denounce me as a false prophet. But the problem is, I didn't come up with this idea. The Apostle John did, the one considered closest to Jesus of all the apostles. John is clearly insisting that there should be a very definite link between our faith in Jesus and our lifestyle. We cannot say we know Jesus and live a wicked life of sexual immorality, constant anger, harshness, and bitterness, and hating our brothers and sisters. In another place, John writes, He who says he's in the light and hates his brother is in darkness until now. Are you seeing a pattern here? John keeps hammering on the words, He who says, he who says, he who says. You say you're a Christian. You say you have believed on Jesus. You say you prayed the sinner's prayer. You say you're going to heaven. You say you're in the light. But you don't live the life Christ demands. And therefore, all you're saying and professing and declaring mean nothing. You have no love for your brothers and sisters. You're still in the darkness. You don't follow the commands of Christ. You're just lying to others and to yourself. In another place, John writes, If you know that he is righteous, you know that everyone who practices righteousness is born of him. Here, John says basically the same thing, but in a slightly different way. He tells us that people who are born of God through faith in Jesus will practice righteousness. And the implication is unmistakable. Those who do not practice a righteous lifestyle have never experienced this new birth. Many Christians today would hate that idea and hate that verse if they ever read it. And they do their best to ignore it and pass over it quickly if they do come across it. Because they will never admit that justification and salvation through Christ virtually always lead to a changed lifestyle. They're so fixated on being a sinner saved by grace and so fixated on the only believe and don't really have to do much of anything that to accept John's teaching that there are certain evidences of the new birth, well, they're just not ready to believe that. In reading this and comparing it with certain passages written by Paul, you might suppose that John and Paul were on two sides of the fence theologically. But that's not the case. Paul is saying that we're saved by grace through faith in Christ Jesus, to which we all say, all of us evangelicals, we say a hearty amen. John? Well, he's saying that evidence of this faith experience with Jesus is that we love our brothers and sisters and we practice righteousness, to which we also say a great big amen. On my Bible channel, we're now offering audio podcasts of the Bible studies Ben and I have in the mornings. An audio podcast means there's no video to watch, and that means you can listen to it while you're doing other things. If you're out and about, you can play it through your car stereo while driving. You can listen through earphones while you walk or exercise at the gym. And if you're at home and going to be in the same room for a while, you can simply put your phone on speaker or you could buy an inexpensive Bluetooth radio and pair it with your phone, or do the same thing with a Bluetooth speaker. 
So welcome to our home as you drop in on Ben and me as we study the Bible together.